Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being distributed and recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed live stream by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow, and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and or microphone and or go to the Facebook Live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone to say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Winslow Myers, a painter and political activist. Winslow, welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be with you, Simeon. Thanks for inviting me on your show. My pleasure. So Winslow, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and how you got into the fine arts. Sure. Well, uh, Maine, where I live now, uh, was a big part of it. It's a beautiful place. And uh, I grew up here. And then after uh, three decades or so of teaching in Massachusetts, I uh, came back. And uh, as a teenager, I lobstered on the Damascata River. And the river is a kind of marine paradise that really hasn't changed very much in uh, 70 years. Uh, there's lots of aquaculture activity on the river now. And uh, my father was one of the first to do aquaculture. Uh, uh, most of the aquaculture now is oysters, but he did it with mussels. And then I became uh, passionate in high school about art uh, and uh, discovered how many main artists there are who, that have done wonderful work. And uh, I began to learn what artists had done here, uh, like uh, John Marin, if you can pull up that slide. One moment, here it comes. There's the river. And there's Marin with his wonderful watercolor touch. And then uh, I was lucky enough to study at Boston University with the great Canadian American still life painter, Walter Murch. Uh, his work, as you can see, set a very high bar. Though he was a representational painter, he showed at the Betty Parsons Gallery, along with a lot of well-known abstract expressionists. He admired Jackson Pollock and always talked about discovering the work of art in the very process of making it. He also taught us that painting is not about duplicating reality, which is impossible, but about creating a new world with its own space and color. So art often comes from other art. For example, the, park, the carpet under the rock in the Merch painting is the carpet stretched over a table comes straight from Vermeer. If you can move to the next. But there's also an original aspect to, uh, to Merch's work. Uh, here's a typical Dutch still life in the next slide. And then 
the next slide. And here is a Merck still life uh, with an air filter. So there's a juxtaposition of drapery, which is a traditional subject in art with an automobile air filter, which is a highly unusual uh, choice of subject. If you could go back, Simeon, one to the, yeah, this looks a little kind of wan by comparison, at least in my judgment. So Merch brings something new back to the Merch. The drapery allows the artist to play with a, for, uh, uh, with a form that is already abstract. And for that matter, the cylinder of the air filter is also. By the way, this painting was done in Maine when Merch was in residence at the Skowhegan School of Art. Now there are other things in Merch's conception of art uh, that kind of put the hook in me and determined to some extent the direction I ended up taking. For example, he held to the idea that it actually weakens the effect of art if it merely tells a story or tries to convey an explicit message. The greatest art doesn't explain, it incarnates. Uh, not that my work always lives up to such a high intention, but I've tried to lean in that direction. Art as visual poetry, as a celebration of the mystery of reality, rather than an explanation of it. I love what the poet Wallace Stevens said, a poem should resist the intelligence almost successfully. Uh, next. Uh, examples of art that uh, I think does this. Uh, this is a, a wonderful Magritte painting. Uh, next. And Giorgio Morandi with his beautiful little bottles. Uh, Morandi reminds us that really all painting is still life. Um, uh, next. And here's a contemporary painter, um, Susan Jane Walt, whose work I admire very much, kind of in the same vein of incarnating. I mean, those blueberries are like the Holy of Holies. Next. So this is the first painting I did uh, after I got out of grad school, about six by four feet. Of course, when you're beginning, you search around and, and try things and even rebel against your mentors. So, certainly nothing Murchian about this painting, which shows me and my future wife and my father. Next. Another early painting shows my wife and her brother who was a Down syndrome. Uh, uh, and uh, this was done back in 1973 when the French Polish painter Balthus was one of my gods. Next. So a little drawing of sail drapery. Working figuratively remains very important to me, but always with a heightened awareness of composition. Uh, horizontals like the, the harmonious line of the clouds over the horizon of the ocean and the horizontal of the boom uh, played off against the verticals of the patterns in the sail. In effect, a move toward uh, abstraction. But I always felt that working with how things look in the world was an appealing challenge. Paintings made with pure colors and shapes can be beautiful, but I could never do one that satisfied me. I try to go with the abstract patterns already in nature to distill form into feeling. So the next uh, four or five paintings uh, is another drawing, which is a little more than a study, uh, done with mixed media, spraying uh, ink onto the canvas, onto the paper. Next. And this is a painting that uh, came out of that drawing. Next. And another uh, sail painting from back in the 70s. Next. Uh, uh, this is kind of a composite imaginary picture of what the Damariscotta River is like with the houses and bridges. 
a little bit surrealist, strange. Next. Uh, I was interested here in uh, working with a whole bunch of different kinds of light, the, the light of twilight outside, the light coming off the uh, television screen, the light coming out of the windows in the background, even the reflection of the light on the framed picture on the left. Next. Uh, so this is uh, looking out of a room at a drive-in screen. Uh, drive-ins became kind of obsolete and apparently now they're coming back. At one point I actually had uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall kissing on the screen and put a lot of work into that and then decided it was, it was better with a blank screen. Uh, I actually uh, went out early in the morning to take photographs on this boat, uh, hoping that uh, the owner wouldn't uh, see that I was there and take a shot at me. Uh, here I was definitely um, interested in all the different diagonals and kind of playing them off against each other for a horizontal composition. I tried all kinds of subject matter just to see if I could make art from it. Uh, this this uh, is a, uh, a painting from Worcester. I found a job teaching art at the Bancroft School in in Worcester, Mass. And I was really grateful to get the job. And I stayed at the school for over 30 years. So this is all made up. It's an, an imagined artist studio looking out at winter in Worcester. On a winter's night, a city can make the sky almost a faint orange with its glow. Next. So working a little larger and getting a little more complicated, uh, this, these buildings and the traffic light all come from different places. The overpass that you see in the background is, uh, actually exists going out of Damascata where I live, or close to where I live. Uh, and next. So by this time I was showing at Kennedy Galleries in Manhattan. And uh, this is a kind of composite image of Worcester, industrial Worcester, three deckers, brick building, brick mills. And this is one of the first paintings I sold through the Kennedy Galleries. Wow. So um, Winslow, just uh, before we go on to our next, uh, our next uh, uh, round table, Thank you so much for this uh, incredible, uh, this incredible introduction to your work. So just tell us a little bit about the reception of the work. So you started off by telling us about Murch uh, and how influential he was in your life. I understand that he died very soon after you met him. Did he respond in any way to what he saw of your work? Because your work doesn't really resemble his very much. I mean, it seems... The, the the I don't know if I can pull them up here again on the screen, the um, the paintings that you have, uh, the first ones that you showed us of uh, of the boat here, I've got it right here. So these ones right here with your father and your future wife, they seem almost um, kind of cartoonish, almost, you know, the, 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 the colors are very, very, very strong very important here also it seems it seems like something you'd see kind of in a in, in a cartoon and um then here i guess i can see the connection with merch but tell us where you know what was the reception there did merch respond what kind of uh, feedback did you get and do you consider already your early ones to be part of was this your style was this pure winslow myers uh, well it takes a long time to figure out who you are um I'll tell you that um, the work I made, I, I, I only uh, had Merch as a teacher for a very short time because of his sudden death. And all this work I've shown you is long after he died. And before this comes a whole bunch of work that uh, 
well, I may have a few examples of it left, but most of it I destroyed. It was student work, uh, unsellable, some of it a little bit imitative of merch. Uh, and, but by the time we get here, I, uh, I certainly have internalized a horror of being mini merch <laughs> and wanting to figure out who I was. And tell us a little bit about um, how you created these, because as you said, they are surreal. They are, I mean, uh, to say that there is a surreal aspect about them, but then you say, okay, well, I took this one on the boat. It was actually a photograph that I took that you, then you created uh, this out of a photograph. Uh, and this one you said is completely made up, except that it was in your your house. I understand. Tell us how you um, how did you go about creating these? Yeah, well, um, I don't know which one you want to pause on. It's all different. I mean, like the the long uh, horizontal lobster boat was definitely uh, I needed a photograph. This one isn't uh, the studio, not even my house. It's just entirely made up. So it's different for different paintings. I might uh, uh, need a photograph or a fragment of it, but uh, essentially the thing starts in my head and then I make doodles uh, on scraps of paper, lots of them. And, and uh, you know, you, uh, there's something about a little tiny doodle that gives you some kind of hope and you take it to the next stage, maybe a, a drawn study and then out to the painting as we'll see. Fantastic. And then you said, uh, when you got finally here, actually, this was sold at a gallery in Manhattan. What? So you already had encountered a lot of success. You're teaching at this uh, well-known school in Worcester. What did the gallery owner, what did the purchaser, the buyer, what did, uh, what did people see in your work that they liked so much? Well, uh, you'd have to ask them, but... Um... Uh, this one was bought by a, a person who's been very uh, supportive of my work and has bought uh, actually four or five paintings of my, and then run out of space and given my work to, the first uh, work of mine to go into a museum was because she gave it to a museum. Uh, and, uh, but this painting also represents a midlife crisis because uh, I had two children and uh, it was getting more and more difficult to produce the, the amount of work that the gallery would like. And so I, um, my whole life went in a different direction, which I guess we're going to talk about. Okay, so we will talk about that right now. Um, we are open to your questions or comments uh, to all the participants. Please don't be afraid. Uh, Winslow's here to answer your questions, to hear your comments. So uh, we will go now on to the second roundtable. And this is called Roundtable Beyond War. In Living Beyond War, a Citizen's Guide, Winslow writes, quote, in one tiny corner of our galaxy, the universe has invested in a high-risk experiment, you and me. We are beings powerful enough to foul and possibly destroy our own life support system, but we also possess the capacity for self-conscious reflection, wonder, and growth. We can learn to see ourselves in each other in spite of our duality, our apparent separateness. We can see the outlines of our common fate beyond our conflicts. We can work together in fuller awareness of our interdependence. We will, will we rise to this immense challenge? Far from being impossible, the possibility of moving beyond war is inherent in the fact that we humans are creatures of successful change. During the four billion years of life on this planet, not one of our biological ancestors made a fatal mistake before reproducing. To survive for that length of time in a constantly changing environment, our ancestors had to be masters of change, end quote. So Winslow, at a certain moment of the Cold War, you walked away from your easel completely. The prospect of nuclear annihilation consumed the attention you had, 
up to that point dedicated to your work as a painter. As a volunteer, at a time when flying was prohibitively expensive, you made monthly trips from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast to take part in promoting the non-governmental organization Beyond War. Please tell us about the book you wrote during that time, Living Beyond War, A Citizen's Guide. Yeah, well, um, I just, uh, I, if you remember 1983, 1984 uh, was the time of the Euro missiles where intermediate range uh, nuclear weapons uh, and missiles were making the response time if there was a mistake, uh, a matter of minutes. And um, I uh, ended up finding this wonderful organization uh, which I enjoyed volunteering for very much. And uh, as you said, uh, flew back and forth to Palo Alto a lot and um, worked with a lot of people in living rooms and um, in larger venues. We just tried to speak to everybody we could. Essentially, it was an educational project. Um, so, I mean, there was a tension between working on art and needing to engage in the world in other ways that really, uh, as I've thought about it for this presentation has stayed with me my whole life. Um, I'm no uh, Albert Camus, but I became aware when I read Camus' work that he experienced a similar tension. He wanted to tell stories that were pure fiction, but he kept getting dragged into the political issues of his day, like the status of Algeria, especially of course the Nazi occupation of France. Anyway, I served on the board of Beyond War and ended up writing this book from which Simeon read a, a passage. Uh, and I, uh, it's really correct to say that I was the executive editor of the book because rather than the writer, because many people uh, collaborated on it. Basic idea is that the destructiveness of nuclear weapons has made all war obsolete. Any small war could become cataclysmic if it draws in the nuclear powers. And we're all in this together. Uh, it's past time to start working together on common issues like climate before the human experiment becomes undone either by nukes or global, the global climate emergency. Winslow, and so uh, this passage that I read, I mean, it's very poetic. It's very, it has this discipline, this, I mean, it's artistic in its writing. How is it that you um, how how is how is it that you felt okay? If I don't do this, nobody will. Because clearly, with your art and your painting, you thought, yes, I need to do this. You know, I have this this vision. It interests me. But you know, that's if I don't do the painting, nobody will. What what about this? Why did you feel such an urgency? Why did you feel such a, a kind of a divine mission to do this? A missionary zeal. Well, it's very simple. I mean, there was a, a Beyond War uh, was timed in such a way that uh, the Cold War came to an end uh, around the time of the Reykjavik uh, and George, uh, the Reykjavik conference started it with uh, Gorbachev and Reagan. And then it, it uh, the Cold War ended with George H.W. Bush. But uh, what I wanted and what this team that worked on the book with me wanted was a mass market uh, book. And the publisher got very excited and thought, oh boy, we can have this uh, in supermarket racks uh, as you go through the cashier and so on. Uh, it didn't turn out quite that way, but um, there it is. And it, uh, it has a perfect record on Amazon. And I, I'm proud of it. And did you speak with any of these politicians? You talked about the Reykjavik conference. Do, does Beyond, Beyond War take credit for any uh, of the successes during the Cold War? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, it's hard to tell, um, but I will say that uh, there was one project that we did uh, that uh, I was indirectly involved with. Uh, we got a group of Russian and American science, Soviet and American scientists together to write a book called Breakthrough which uh, is, a, if you read it now, is a rather dry book about uh, preventing accidental nuclear war. Uh, but these scientists 
on the Soviet side uh, were quite high up. In fact, one of them was a science advisor to Gorbachev and Gorbachev ended up reading our book. And uh, did that make a difference? <laughs> Who knows? But uh, it was very exciting to have that kind of high level contact. So you can't uh, in any way say, oh, well, that was a waste of time. I should have been painting at that time. Really, this was actually a stellar moment in, in your life. I'll, I'll, I'll hold it dear forever. I mean, yeah, no, I have no regrets about that. Okay, wow. So now we'll get back into the painting. How did that, oh, and Dr. Davis wants to say something. Hi, Dr. Davis. Hi, 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 Sue. Uh, that's uh, some very nice comments you made, but what, would you take what you just said about uh, Mr. Gorbachev, and I was around, of course, at that time, uh, into today's world situation with the uh, threat of nuclear uh, use of, of arms in the Ukraine uh, problem? Well, uh, it's very clear that uh, a lot of the hopes that Beyond War had have not been realized. Uh, we were terribly excited by the end of the Cold War and it looked like uh, you know, it might usher in a new era, but then we got back into Iraq and Afghanistan and now this horrible Ukraine thing. Uh, uh, what I can only repeat over and over again is it's crazy. Uh, we, uh, we're, reality is telling us that we need to leave off all this uh, uh, war stuff and conflict and this awful conflict that's possible between China and the United States and start cooperating on the level of common problems. First of all, climate change. So my hopes and dreams uh, were certainly not realized, but uh, we're still here and we can still try. We can all continue trying. So let's move on to our next round table, which is about diptychs and the beauty of the industrialized world. So Winslow, we're gonna take a look now at what you began once you finished beyond, uh, once at the end of the Cold War. So tell us about these, uh, your next projects and how you got into painting again. Yeah, uh, this painting is out of chronology, but it fits here. Um, I, I painted this particular painting in response to the Ukraine invasion fairly recently. Um, once again, there's a tension for me uh, because really I, I would like to keep, uh, as I said before, uh, the, something that has too explicit a message uh, doesn't always uh, have a, a solid life as art, but um, this was my way of responding now uh, to the situation. Uh, and so it has crept in from time to time. I think uh, the next couple of slides, yeah, these are just uh, little paintings that I used photographs for uh, when I was flying back and forth Palo Alto back in the eighties. That's going over the Grand Canyon. These paintings are about 16 inches on the side. Then once uh, the Cold War was over and I got back into painting, I uh, began to work on a series of large diptychs. Uh, this one I'm putting here, it's not the first one, but I'm putting it here because it uh, has this, again, a Trident submarine on the right. A uh, number of people have said, well, then is that nuclear winter on the left? And uh, I don't blame them for thinking that, but what I was really interested in was the phenomenon of snow falling, thawing, and then making open patches, and then it snows again. This is a very main phenomenon, at least it was before climate change. Uh, so it's actually a hopeful, for me, a hopeful image, not doom and gloom. This gives you an idea of the uh, scale of the paintings. Uh, Winslow and the the scale of those paintings is that have, have what drew you to that? I mean, when uh, for instance, I when I think about painting, I think about large paintings like that, and I just I, I I think, wow, how do you do that? I mean, that's 
that's a huge challenge. Is it more challenging to paint big than to paint small? What, how is it that you became attracted to these very large format paintings? Well, you know, this sounds like a silly answer, but it might be the answer. And that is, uh, I really don't do very well with small motor control. Uh, it's, it's actually easier for me to paint big uh, because uh, if there's any tremor in the brush or anything, uh, it's not so bad at this size. But there are other things too. I mean, uh, I think the scale, um, the, the scale of these paintings is you know, spread your arms wide. So I would call it a human scale, even though most people's houses don't have big enough walls for them. So that's affected the saleability of your paintings? Definitely. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just read, uh, read something here that I had written down. Winslow, following the end of the Cold War, you return to your easel and you set out to this on this curious artistic journey. You wanted to combine things that popular society doesn't want to belong together. And ex for example, an industrialized size tire tread and a fair-skinned young woman who could easily be a model for a French cosmetics company. These paintings are not surrealist. They are representational, even exuding a photo-like quality. Yet the whole undertaking comes across as somewhat paradoxical. You seek out beauty from objects born from the Industrial Revolution, the same revolution that would eventually bear nuclear arms. You paint fighter jets and mushroom clouds. Is it right to say that you could find beauty in a nuclear armed war, a nuclear warhead and pair it with the natural world? Please guide us through some of the paintings you produced after a decade as a peace activist to help us see beauty where we would normally shield our eyes. So again, as you said, this is kind of, we don't normally put these two scenes together, winter and summer, submarine and uh, rocks, I guess, or, or, or snow. Um, so tell us now, gu guide us through a little bit why you wanted to put things together that don't belong together. Well, I think it come, it's a difficult question, but I think it comes down to uh, a principle of design that all artists are concerned with, which is contrast. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have contrast of light and dark or contrast of colors. Uh, and if you do this split, you can put uh, two seasons or two times a day or two very disparate forms together. And I think uh, it, they don't come together as a single gestalt, as it were, uh, easily, uh, depending on which one you're looking at. So, Again, I would say there's some tension in that, and maybe that tension, well, I hope it adds to the work, that sense of disease and, and unexpectedness. And again, about the uh, industrial objects together with, uh, we are today, you know, we think about, uh, you know, I mean, even in the 1970s, the Arbor Day and about how beautiful natural objects are and that we want to somehow get rid of the rubber. We don't like plastic. We want all, the, all of those things to somehow, they don't belong, you know, in this uh, pantheon of, of what is uh, fine art. Fine art should be something, you know, that would, uh, uh, that goes beyond, you know, uh, ordinary life. Tell us what, what beauty do you find or what would you hope that someone would find in that tire tread? Well, look at, I mean, it's a wonderful form, uh, the way those treads uh, fall down toward the bottom and it's fun to paint. And, uh, you know, maybe I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it actually, there is an echo of Merch because he, uh, he would put together things like an automobile carburetor and a lemon. Um, so uh, maybe he hangs on in me more than I sometimes think. If you go on to the next slide, I think I have a, uh, yeah. I've forgotten whether I saw this late Brock painting before I started doing the diptychs or afterwards, but either way, uh, this, there's not, in my paintings, there's an actual 
V-shaped groove and the two sides are bolted together. Here uh, in Brock, it's, uh, it's just a painted illusion. Anyway, it kind of confirmed that uh, uh, what I was, you know, kind of confirmed what I was doing in a nice way. So again, my intention was that when you put a frame around a double image like this, that people could read it as one if I supplied enough abstract shapes that kind of echo across between the two sides. Uh, this one, uh, uh, I uh, took my late wife, she was, became very ill in 2003 and I, we took her down to Key West for a holiday and uh, I went out on this large schooner and took a lot of pictures which inspired this piece. Uh, the right side is more or less uh, a made up version of New York City. And uh, I turned the dude ship into a, a work boat with bags of rice or bananas or whatever. And then I had a student of mine at the school uh, pose for the guy on the front. And Winslow, tell us again about the the imagination in all this. So uh, for the bananas and the the sacks of rice, you're doing drawings beforehand. But then, why do you need uh, that your student to pose for you? Well, I don't think I could make up the muscles of the back in that student just from whole cloth. So I needed help. And the same for the. Uh, the railroad wheels, the wheels of the railroad car on the right. Uh, I needed a photograph for that. The rest of it is made up. And Winslow, a little bit about the railroad car. I, I mean, have you had, uh, what kind of reaction, reception have you had to, to this painting in particular, where you have, again, you know, the, uh, the numbers written on the railroad car? I mean, are, uh, there's this um, harsh, harsh reality, it seems to them, they seem to kind of yell out at you. Whereas, you know, the, the, the man's back, the boy's back and the, the soft, uh, the, the soft folds of the sail, I mean, seem to just invite you in there. I mean, it, it, based on how we, how we see kind of our culture today, how, how have, uh, what have people said about this? Well, you've answered your own question in terms of uh, contrast between something harsh, a little harsher, and something a little softer, the blue, blueness of the, of the water. Um, this painting is still in my studio, and <laughs> I, it's been exhibited a number of times, but uh, uh, about this particular painting, I don't know. I, it was a kind of a general range of reaction to these uh, diptychs uh, all the way from, I love it to, uh, it makes me very anxious and uneasy and I wish you'd stop doing it. <laughs> and how do you respond when someone tells you that? Uh, well, ultimately, as we'll see, I responded by uh, saying after 29 of these that enough was enough. Um, this one uh, sold to the family uh, of this young man who is now out of college. Um, and again, I uh, enjoyed the contrast between the, the boy's hair and the harshness of the bridge. And I enjoyed kind of implying the body of the boy underneath that shirt, which I took a long time painting. This one I, uh, is quite abstract in terms of horizontals, verticals, and diagonals. I actually built a little cardboard model of that funnel on top, wind funnel. So I couldn't find a photograph that worked right for me. So night and day, land and sea, on a ship and compared to hopper cars. So I thought I'd, uh, 
to show the process. After a lot of doodles, I would uh, get to the point where I could make a, uh, a formal sketch. And this is about 12 by 12 inches. And, uh, and then on to the next. This is a 30 by 30, so it's a half size. Um, and next after that. So this is 60 by 60. And uh, by the end of painting this, I never wanted to see another uh, wire fence in my life. Uh, but um, I was pleased with the result. So that gives you an idea of the process. This one, I, uh, I lived in Vermont for four years and uh, that's my brother's boat. And, uh, and then uh, the, uh, an interpretation of the ski trails at, at Stowe. And uh, in there are some sort of rough and ready things like the dirt pile at the bottom and the guardrail which I've used in a number of paintings because I like the form. I think of the various diptychs. Uh, this one is quite, relatively speaking, harmonious and successful in the way the line of the shore of the distant island goes across and is picked up by the top of the bridge and the curves in the railroad uh, tracks and the uh, and the jib uh, harmonized in a good way. Uh, and I think, yeah, this one was inspired by uh, newspaper photographs I saw of the big uh, fire in the Gulf uh, where the, um, the oil, uh, platform got on fire and it went on for a long time before they could put it out. And uh, I put that column of smoke into a volcano. And, uh, I've made a couple paintings of uh, radio telescopes. Um, uh, the, uh, I, if the, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the larger story of the universe and uh, very, very excited by the, um, the telescope that they put out a couple million miles away from us and what that's going to reveal. This is uh, more or less a view out of a window uh, to the west, uh, to the Hudson, New York City on the left. And on the right, uh, we took a windsurfing trip to Baja, California, and there was a there's a big island down there called Isla Saralvo, which is just rock, and uh, combined that with a century plant. Uh, my, my daughter taught school for a while in St. John, the Virgin Islands, and I went down to visit her, and we went out on this uh, schooner, and I decided to contrast uh, that with gritty Worcester and winter and freight car. Um, again, Vermont on the right, cold winter and early spring with a steam locomotive. Uh, I've always been really fascinated by trains and I, I think uh, it came from the fact that when I was a very, very young child, you could actually get on a sleeper car in Princeton, New Jersey and go all the way up to Maine uh, and wake up in the morning and get off in Damascara. I, uh, where we live right now, uh, there's a, a train, there's a, a railroad that goes right by, which I love. So that's the last of the diptychs, that's uh, Monterey, out the plane window, but uh, mountains in Monterey, Mexico, and, and the freights and the bridge are more or less here. So this was the last diptych I tried. Um, Winslow, and just to be clear, before we go on to our next uh, topic, we should not, you would not want the viewer 
to be making um, to think that you are trying to tell them, for instance, in this painting that uh, trains are uh, bad or you're not trying to make these value judgments per se to tell a story, you know, about uh, about something that's bad versus something that's good. You're you're simply opening up to wonder. Is that right? You want people to look at things and 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 be kind of in awe. Is that right? Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay, because when I I as as you said before. Uh, uh, about Edward Hopper that many people think, oh, well, he, his paintings are trying to show us how sad the industrialized world is, and that that's not necessarily the case, that we, th there may not be, you know, a, a story that's trying to be told, or one story that's trying to be told, there may be many stories that are trying to be told, and that we should not have an interpretation uh, uh, set in stone. So, yeah, I mean, I think Hopper's work is, uh, which I love, is, I would call it austerely joyous, kind of like the music of Bach. Fantastic. So um, now, uh, because we're running out of time, I just want you to tell us a little bit about recently you read, uh, you read, uh, delivered a speech at the Mid Coast Forum on Foreign Affairs entitled Beyond Nuclear Deterrence to Climate cooperation and you write quote can we shift how we think about both nuclear war and climate instability by bringing together these two existential threats one sudden and one more gradual all nine nuclear powers are spending trillions to renew their arsenals at the same moment that human activity is causing melting ice caps rising seas and ever more ferocious hurricanes the tensions between the superpowers could not be more real, nor cause more actual suffering in places like Ukraine, nor exhibit greater potential for world-ending miscalculation. But in the context of the global climate emergency, games of nuclear chicken and competitive jockeying for spheres of influence appear at best oddly beside the point, and at worst, a stubborn resistance to working together to meet common existential threats." End quote. Winslow, even though you told me that Beyond War lost its purpose at the end of the Cold War, your career as a political activist has continued. What are your current thoughts on the global political situation today? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that talk tried to tried to articulate what I'm feeling, uh, what I think we're all feeling, in a sense. Um, I think the, uh, the 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 answer to uh, all of this is to bring the climate issue to the fore and, and see if we can get uh, people of diverse views and different nations to work on it together, which is the easiest thing in the world to say and the, apparently the hardest thing to do. Well, if we don't do it, uh, we're toast. Um, there's one resource for this that I think is extremely important um, and that is the scientific uh, story of the unfolding of the universe itself uh, over 13.85 billion years. The more people know this story, the more they sense that it's everybody's story and we're, we're all, we all came from it. And uh, uh, obviously our, our corrupted news system um, emphasizes division, especially certain media powerhouses and, and uh, uh, I think the, the unity interdependence should be emphasized much more. And that implies a, a, a shift of mind and heart in individual people. Wow. Okay. So let's go on now to your work today. So you just recently published a book on your master, uh, how should I say, your master teacher, influencer, Walter Tandy Merch. That's forward by George Lucas. Yeah, we always felt that he deserved uh, uh, a big book, and it took 50 years. But uh, uh, Lucas uh, turns out to be a big collector of Murch's work, so he was very, very helpful in uh, getting this project done, and, and uh, I'm very happy with it. At the same time, we uh, moved just about at the beginning of COVID, and here's my 
studio with one of the diptychs in it. As you can see, we're running out of space. Uh, and um, on the, I'm trying to work as, as small as I possibly can. And uh, uh, this is the third, what's on the easel there is the third of, of a series. This is the first uh, that I call Carscapes. Um, uh, again, the car obviously is taken from a real car, but uh, the rest of it is made up. Uh, next, uh, another one, this was using our uh, Chevrolet electric car. Um, next, and using the same car, but to very different effect. Um, Baltus, uh, the painter Baltus once remarked that Bonar could make art out of central heating or anything else for that matter, which I loved hearing that. It encouraged me to go on doing what I do and sometimes using uh, motifs that most people not, might not find all that beautiful. Um, so this, this was a commission for a friend of mine, uh, Jean-Louis Bourgeois, who's the son of the uh, sculptor, Louis Bourgeois. He has an apart had an apartment uh, in downtown New York and wanted me to make a painting out of his window. On to the next. Uh, this was a fun painting. Uh, we, we spend a little time in Belize each winter because my partner's son lives there. Uh, you To get anywhere in Belize, you have to fly in a little puddle jumper. And I took a lot of photographs of rivers out the window. So this is a composite of my experience. And uh, uh, I had an Airbnb customer who I asked to pose for this, uh, for the pilot. I put one of my shirts on him and it was too big, but made him, gave him lots of wrinkles in his shirt, which worked out okay. So this is a Belize painting, early morning light, wind, warm wind. Wish I was there right now. Next. Uh, this is one I just saw in Belize, a small painting of a coffee pot and a century plant, uh, about 15 inches on the side. A bigger painting of Belize, again, trying the tractor tire. That was pretty much the inspiration for the thing. Trip to uh, San Miguel in New Mexico resulted in this painting, which uh, the cacti and the tower are from real life. The rest of it is made up. I wanted here to try again to uh, combine a smoky column of smoke with nice uh, turquoise water. Again, a radio telescope. I just like the form of it, combined with a, the top of a freight car. And another uh, freight painting, memory of Worcester in winter. And uh, again, using the uh, unpromising, but interesting to me, uh, guardrail form. Uh, and, uh, uh, an imaginary river with an overpass. These are a, a couple of paintings of, which have a kind of surrealist tinge of roses. This is, uh, the next one is uh, kind of right at the end of winter, early spring. And a recent one, of a chart kind of flying in the wind and looking down the Damascata River. This is a very large painting. It's about six feet high. I was just interested in getting the light. Another painting where I tried to work in a, a chart and a folded sail, fairly large painting. 
again, combination of railroad and ocean. And steel bridge and a car again with a tire. Seem to like tires. And uh, I'm including here at the end a few of my portraits, which are just fun to do. Much easier to do than the imaginative work because you're just concentrating on getting a good likeness. Uh, I think there are four or five of these. We can run through them quite quickly. Little girl, father and his son. Another little Mayan girl from Belize. And a friend of mine from Worcester, a photo photo photographer. That's his camera strap over his shoulder. My daughter. And my partner who makes everything possible. So did we make it? We've gone through all of them. So Winslow, wow. Tell us. Um, so what um, would you say if Merch was uh, here today? What, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what are your thoughts now having made such, you know, an incredible contribution to the fine arts and to political, to peace on earth, to, to man's well-being? So what, what do you think now when you're looking back and as you look forward? Well, uh, I, I, um, I painted this morning. I'm, I, uh, at 82, the body is betraying me a little bit, but um, basically there's nothing like uh, sitting in front of the easel and working on a big piece and uh, listening to Bach or Bob Dylan. And uh, occasionally uh, writing an op-ed or giving a talk, uh, hoping that I'm in the current as it were. Uh, and uh, you know, it'll continue as long as it will continue. Okay, well, let it continue then. So let's see how we can stay in touch with Winslow. Here's his website. It's easy enough, winslowmyers.com. And you can see pretty much all of the paintings I think that we went through. Um, he has the, the diptychs here and the portraits here. And then you can read about his incredible life there <laughs> under Vita. And then he's got his contact. So people can reach out to you at Winslow at winslowmyers.com, Winslow. Yes, sir. Perfect. And there's your phone number. So please feel free to reach out to Winslow. Um, he, uh, If you're looking to buy paintings, remember, you need a very large house because he has large paintings. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind or put an extension on your house. So anyways, uh, I will put that again in the, uh, I'll put that in the chat room right now. So it's winslowmyers.com. Feel free to reach out to him. Thank you so very much, Winslow Myers. You sound very satisfied. Keep up the good work. Thank you, I hope to. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Simeon, very much for doing this. I appreciate it. My, pl my pleasure. So let's take a look at what's coming up next week. We have Matthew Matsota. What is public art? If John Singer Sargent's intimate portraits of individuals and families are prime examples of private art, then Matthew Matsota's massive interactive installations are prime examples of so-called public art. Let's consider the storefront theater on Main Street in Lyons, Nebraska. Matsota first led discussion rounds with city residents about what kind of art the city would be proud to showcase. As might be lamented about many main streets around today's Western world, Lyon residents saw the street, the former social and economic center of their city, as a desolate reminder of globalization. The residents wanted Lyon's public art to rejuvenate Main Street. One resident even mentioned that a former storefront was just that, there was no building behind the store. 
together, Medzata and the residents then turns that very storefront into a theater unlike any other in history. Come welcome artists Matthew Mazzolta and Sylvia Eisenberger Kuntz, Secretary General of the Society of Friends of the Fine Arts Vienna, to our show, and let's get to know what public art is all about. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmoro.com. Once again, that's next Wednesday, Matthew Matota. What is public art? Once again, thank you so very much to Winslow Myers. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan and Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire and Nobleboro, Maine, goodbye and see you next Wednesday. <laughs>